Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, quite likely, a lot of you have been wondering about margarine lately. Wondering what it's made of, what it tastes like, whether it's really nutritious. Of course, I'm not qualified to speak for all margarines, but I can tell you about parquet margarine. The delicious, nutritious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet is a wholesome vegetable margarine made from selected American farm products in Kraft's spick-and-span modern plants. And as for flavor... Well, parquet margarine is made by Kraft to the same high standards of flavor and quality as all of Kraft's fine foods. Parquet's flavor is really outstanding. It's known, you see, as the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. Now, about food value. Parquet margarine is a wholesome, nourishing food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So with these facts in mind... Ask your dealer tomorrow for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Well, now let's see what's happening with the great Gildersleeve. It's 5 o'clock in the afternoon and the great man is just arriving home. He's a little early this afternoon since big things are afoot. And as he enters the house, he finds Marjorie and Leroy in the parlor. Well, 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 happy little family. You're looking very pretty, my dear. Thank you, Uncle Morse. So are you, Leroy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mr. Gildersleeve, Miss Ransom just phoned. She wants you to come right over. Oh, well, I'm going right over, Bertie. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's going on over there, Unc? Everybody's invited but me. Well, it's not exactly a party, Leroy. It's a committee meeting. We're going to raise some money to buy the town a new fire engine. A new fire engine? Yeah, the old one's got no pumping power, and besides, it never gets to the fire till half an hour too late. Oh, that's not on account of the engine, Uncle Mort. It's on account of the driver. What are you talking about? Well, Charlie Prentice drives the fire engine, and Charlie is nuts about a girl who lives way out on Lincoln Avenue. Well, what of it? Well, every time they go to a fire, Charlie drives past her house no matter where the fire is. I don't believe that, Leroy. Well, you can ask anybody. When they go past the house, he waves at her and she waves back at him. Unless the old man's home. Yep. <laughs> Leroy, I'm sure that story is nonsense, but I'll look into it. We'll have no three-alarm courtships in this town if I can help it. Are you all ready to go, Marjorie? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gilsey, but are you going to be out for supper? No, no, Bertie. I'll be back for supper. He's just going over there to buy a fire engine. Oh, you go long, Leroy. Uh, he isn't joking, Bertie. I am going to buy a fire engine. Mr. Gilsey, you can't keep a fire engine in your garage. Uh, I'm not going to buy it for myself, Bertie. The town of Summerfield's going to buy it. I'm just a member of a committee to raise the money. Oh, what do a fire engine cost, Mr. Gilsey? Well, another committee is looking into that. I'd guess around $1,000. <laughs> My, my. Do that include the tires? Uh, Yes, that's with everything. How are you going to raise $1,000, Unc? We're going to put on some kind of entertainment. Oh, amateur night. Well, I don't know what kind of a thing it'll be exactly, but I suppose they'll be after me to play a prominent part. Is Judge Hooker going to be in it, too? Hooker? What can he do? Send petty crooks up for 30 days? That's not entertainment, my boy. (laughs) No. Have you ever heard him recite the children's hour? No. He does. Yeah. Well, he won't do it in this show. Oh, my goodness, I gotta go. Maybe I can help Leela get a few things ready. Shall I come now, too, Uncle Mort? Uh, well, uh, suppose you just wait till you see someone else coming, then you come over, huh? You see, I haven't seen Leela at all today. I get it. Leroy. Everybody gets it, Uncle Mort. Uh, you go on, and I'll be over in a few minutes. Oh, well. Who said a man is only young once? <laughs> <laughs> afraid it was some of the others. Am I early? I hope. <laughs> well, there's nobody else here yet, if that's what you mean. Oh, good. You know, I'm so excited. I love giving tea parties, don't you? Now, let's see. There'll be Marjorie and Judge Hooker and Dr. Pettibone and Mrs. Pettibone. Yeah, why did Hooker have to ring her in for? She always wants to run everything. 
But this is one show Mrs. Pettibone's not going to run. Well, I hope we'll get to play opposite each other, Throckmorton. Wouldn't that be romantic? We will. Either they make you my leading lady or I don't accept the part. <laughs> and I hope it will be a costume play. Well, I think something with a little singing in it would go well. You know, I have this perfectly gorgeous costume. It was my great-grandmother Winfield's wedding gown with a hoop skirt and no shoulders and all. Oh, I'd like to see that. <laughs> I wore it in the performance we gave down in Savannah, and it was a tremendous success. Uh, the gown, I mean. The entertainment lost money, but the bowl weevil was bad that year. <laughs> well, the gown is in, definitely. <laughs> Grace is here. I am rambling on, and I've got biscuits in the oven. I'll have to excuse uh, me. Have to ask you to excuse me for a moment, Throckmorton. Oh, don't get nervous. Let me come and help you. Oh, goodness, no. You sit down, and I'll be right back. Oh, no, no. Let me help. Oh, the kitchen is a mess. And I must apologize for the way I look. I'm a perfect fright in this old apron and all. That's the cutest apron I ever saw in my life. It ruffles. <laughs> oh, gracious, it's just an old thing I had around the house. And I'm afraid I'll probably have flour on my nose. You're adorable with flour on your nose. Have I? Where? Want me to show you? Please. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Track Martin, let me go. It's probably burned. Oh, no, let it burn. Well, if you want to help me here, you'll have to help. Otherwise, I shall have to banish you to the park. Well, just tell me what to do. Well, first, stop interfering with the cook. I make no promises. Well, for a wonder, the biscuits are not ruined. I'll give them a few minutes more. Leela, this is kind of fun, isn't it? Watching the biscuits? No. Being here in the kitchen together. You know what I'm pretending? What, Throckmorton? I'm pretending it's our kitchen. Oh, let's do that. Let's play house. <laughs> yes, let's. Now, first, you must put on an apron, darling, so you won't spoil your nice new suit. Here, I'll get you one of mine. Well, uh, uh, your apron would never fit me. <laughs> we'll try it. Now, stand still. Uh. Why, the strings won't even meet and buy. I told you. Are you so big or am I so small? It's you, honey. You're no bigger than a minute. Oh, why, that just isn't so, Throckmorton. Though, of course, my great-grandmother Winfield was famous for her tiny waist. And I can get her wedding gown on without any trouble, hardly. Yeah. I'll bet I can get my hands around your waist. Now, now. Gonna have to, gonna have to send you to the parlor. Uh, Throckmorton, do me a great favor, will you? Anything for you. Uh, get me a can of anchovies. That's a lime. You'll find them in the pantry closet. Uh, where in the closet? On about the third shelf, I think, toward the back. Oh! <laughs> what is this, River McGee's closet? <laughs> Oh, no, I just got hit on the head with a load of canned goods, that's all. <laughs> Leela, what is all this? You've got enough canned stuff in there to start a grocery. What's the idea? Well, maybe you'll think it's silly of me, Throckmorton, but I call that my hope chase. <laughs> but Leela... Well, you see, I have this little man down at the Supreme Market, and he's just as nice. Every now and then he slips me an extra can of something, and I just put it away here for when we're married. But, Leela, that's hoarding. I'm not hoarding, Throckmorton. I'm just saving up. If you, can tell me the, if you can tell me the difference between that and hoarding, it's unpatriotic, Leela. Are you implying that I'm unpatriotic, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, well, you don't mean to be. You might be interested to know that I had a grandfather who was a general. Well, he's probably turning over in his grave right now, then. <laughs> the Army needs the food, Leela. That's why it's a crime to buy any more than you need. Oh, so I'm a criminal now. Well, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. I scrimp and save to make everything nice for you, and this is the kind of thanks I get. Uh, this is the way you play house. <laughs> oh, brother, what a start for a tea party. Thank you, Marjorie. Well, if you ask me, I think what we ought to do is give a concert. After all, we have some very fine talent here in Summerfield. Mrs. Ransom plays the piano beautifully. Oh, Throckmorton. You do. And I'm told that our friend Peavy here is a real artist on the flute. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I, <laughs> I haven't played since the town band broke up, and then it was a piccolo. Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> you can practice up, Peavy. 
Then there's Dr. Pettibone here. I'm sure he has his musical side. How about it, Doctor? Oh, I'm a wizard with the saw. (laughs) (laughs) You see, folks, we have a wealth of musical talent present. And, of course, I can always sing if necessary. I don't think it'll be necessary. (laughs) What do you mean, Hooker? Well, you're charging admission for this. You've got to give them something for their money. Ah, no, a costume drama. Yes. Now, I recall a performance we gave some years ago of A Tale of Two Cities, in which I happened to play the part of Sidney Carton. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. That is a far, far worse performance than I've ever heard. (laughs) Well, it's better than your singing. Uh, Why don't we have a minstrel show? I'll be down to get you in the taxi, honey. Yes, love. Let's agree on one thing. Shall we, everyone? There will be no singing. Time for that. If there's anything worse than an amateur baritone, I don't know what it is. Well, now, just a minute, Mrs. Pettibone. Excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve, but while I have the floor, I should also like to say that I don't think we're going to accomplish anything at this meeting unless we organize. Organize? Yes. I think we should have a chairman. I nominate Mrs. Pettibone. Oh, that's very kind of you, Judge Hooker. But I'm afraid with my many other duties, the women's club and so on, all in favor, I oppose nobody. (laughs) Well, Well, I I guess I have nothing to say about it then. Look her eyes. I suppose my first act should be to appoint a secretary. And for that, I think we should choose one of our non-performing members. Uh, Mr. Peavy. He plays the piccolo. Nevertheless, I shall appoint Mr. Peavy. Mm-hmm. But I, I've never been a secretary before, Mrs. Pettibone. All you have to do is write down the minutes. Uh, give him a pencil and paper, somebody. Now, there arises the question of what type of entertainment we're going to give. Chairman asked what type of entertainment. I think we ought to give them a good drama, like a tale of two cities. Well, why don't we give them something more popular, something that's been on Broadway? Oh, I think a costume play would be I quite... still think we ought to do something musical. Uh, just a moment. Would you repeat those suggestions, please, for the minute? Yes. Uh, never mind, Mr. Peavy. As chairman, I think I can settle this very quickly. It happens that I have a play which I wrote myself that I think would be perfect. The chairman suggested own play. Is there any singing in it, Mrs. Pettibone? No. Oh. Gildersleeve wants to sing. Um, (laughs) But I'm I'm sure you'll like the story, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's about this terribly attractive man. He comes home from Paris and runs into this sweet young thing. Oh, Leela. And they fall madly in love. Oh, sounds very interesting. Go on. Uh, Would you repeat that, please, for the minute? (laughs) Later, Mr. Peavy. I won't tell you the whole plot now, but it's a wonderful part for the right man. Oh, great. And I think it would be perfect for Judge Hooker. Hooker? I thought this was supposed to be a romantic part. Well, whom would you suggest, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, I wouldn't want to suggest anybody, but there must be two or three people here who could do better than the part than Hooker. Two, anyway. Or one, at least. (laughs) Would you repeat that, please, for the minute? Oh, never mind. Don't tell me you think you could play the part, Gildy. Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Can you imagine Gildersleeve as a lover? <laughs> <laughs> Why, Gildersleeve, you're 60 pounds overweight. I told you six months ago, keep eating those starches, you'll bust those arches. <laughs> Nobody loves a fat man, you know that. <laughs> Leela, do you agree with that? Well, no, Throckmorton, of course not. But I do think they've got a point. Oh, you too, eh? Oh. Now, don't take it so personally, Throckmorton. After all, your waistline is something you just can't get around. (laughs) Very good. Gildersleeve's waistline is something you can't get around. (laughs) Wait a minute. I don't see that that's so very funny. No, Marjorie. My uncle may be a little big, but I'd rather be big like him than small and mean like all of you. (gasps) Never mind, my dear. Let you and I go home. And he can sing, too. Gildersleeve, you're acting like a spoiled baby. Really, Mr. Gildersleeve, I must say. Throckmorton, in my own house, I think you might show a little more consideration. I'll show you some consideration. I'm going home. But before I go, I want to say that for a bunch of ignorant, incompetent, stupid people, this committee takes the cake. (laughs) Would someone repeat that, please, for the minute? (laughs) 
Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. You know, that nursery rhyme about old Mother Hubbard and her bare cupboard has a pretty up-to-the-minute ring to it these days. Because many of you are finding, I suppose, that favorite food products are sometimes missing from your grocer's shelves. Take the case of parquet margarine, for example, Kraft's delicious spread for bread. Even though Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied, some dealers just can't keep up with the ever-increasing demand. That's because more people are asking for parquet margarine than ever before. They've discovered how deliciously good parquet is, how nutritious it is, too. Of course, maybe you've been lucky. Maybe your dealer has always had enough parquet to go around. But with a war on, it's wise to watch your dealer's stocks and buy parquet whenever you can. Remember, besides being an excellent energy food, parquet margarine is a reliable year-round source of important vitamin A. So always watch for, always ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve and his campaign to provide Summerfield with a new fire engine. Several days have passed. He's still on the outs with Mrs. Pettibone and her committee, but in the bosom of his family, we find him his old genial self. Bertie, you're a queen. I'll bet there's not another cook in the country who can make coffee cake like this. Oh, I didn't make that, Mr. Gillsleeve. Miss Ransom sent it over. Oh, well, now, isn't that nice of her? <laughs> like another piece, Mr. Gillsleeve? No. And if you see me reaching for one, take it away from me. I'm reducing. Reducing? What's come over you, Unc? Well, nothing. What's so strange about my reducing? Can a leopard change his spots? Huh? Can the ch hippo change his potamus? Yeah. <laughs> Gee, Roy, that's not very nice. Well, let the boy speak his mind, my dear. I seem to be fair game for everybody else. I don't know why my own nephew shouldn't pass a few remarks. There. I thought those people were very rude making fun of you the other night. Leroy should have better manners. Well, I may have flown off the handle a little myself, Marjorie. But the truth be known, I am a trifle overweight just at present. Yeah, you're really filling out there, Unc. All right, that's enough. You're developing quite a rotunda. Yep. <laughs> Leroy, that'll be quite sufficient. I've been noticing it too, Mr. Gilson. You, you too, Bertie? <laughs> yes, sir. The last few weeks you've been busting all the buttons off your pajamas. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think I'll drop a pound or two and get back into fighting trim. A pound or two, he says. Say, hey, here comes Judge Hooker. Oh, Judge Hooker, eh? Coming around now, huh? They'll all be coming around now, I suppose. Now, Uncle Mort, be nice to him. I know he must feel terrible about the other evening. Well, he'll have to be a little nice to me first. I'll go. Hi, Judge. Morning, Leroy. I haven't seen you for some time. Well, anytime you want to see me, I'm right here. <laughs> Marjorie, you're looking very charming this morning. Thank you. Bertie, how are you? Just fine, Judge. Just fine. Got all over that, uh, whatever it was? Oh, yeah. I had a little misery last night, but it's gone now. <laughs> That's good. Well, Gildy. Well, Judge, I suppose you've come here to apologize. Well, we talked it over. You can forget about what happened the other night. I've already dismissed it from my mind, and you with it. Now, Gildersleeve, don't be a sore head. Listen, is that any way to apologize? Gildersleeve, you don't deserve an apology. But the unfortunate fact is we can't get along without you. Sure. If we're going to get anywhere with this project, we've got to have you in on it. Uncle Mort, I think you ought to. Well, I'm willing to go halfway with you, Judge. Well, we'll go the other half. All right. Who gets a lead in the play? <laughs> well, now, Gildy, we went into all that the other night. Yeah, uh, so I remember. Let's face it, old man. If you don't fit the part... Who says I don't fit the part? Well, Mrs. Pettibone wrote the play. She ought to know. Mrs. Pettibone. We're having another meeting at her house. And if you just come around, I'm sure... Hooker, I wouldn't go near Mrs. Pettibone's house if it were the last house on earth. And you can tell her so. Gildersleeve, you're just being bullheaded. Out of my way. I'm due down at the office. I'm a busy man, Hooker. I haven't got any time for charade. Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Mrs. Pettibone. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. She's been laying for me. Oh, hello, Mrs. Pettibone. Oh, you've been avoiding me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, no, I haven't. I've been busy. Oh, yes, you have. But you know, I don't blame you. A man in your position must have so many things on his mind. Well, as a matter of fact, I have. Now, today, I have to see a man at 11, and then I have to see another man at 11.30. Oh, think of that. Well, I hate to impose on you when you're so frightfully busy, but we're having another meeting tonight at my house, and I really feel that the water department should be represented. It's such a worthy cause. Well, as you know, Mrs. Pettibone, the fire engine is very close to my heart. Really? 
quickly, Mr. Gildersleeve. I don't see how we could accomplish anything without you. There's always Judge Hooker. Oh, you know, Judge Hooker is a dear old thing. But then he is old, and he tends to forget things. And he dawdles. Yeah. Now, one thing I'll say for you, Mr. Gildersleeve, you're not a dawdler. You're a doer. Yeah. Well, I've always prided myself on getting things do, uh, done. <laughs> exactly the kind of man we need, the executive type. Oh, the world is so full of dreamers, isn't it? And there are so few of us who really get things done. Oh, dear, the world. What are we going to do about it? Uh, oh, well, uh, see you at 8 o'clock tonight. But wait a minute. I'm simply thrilled that you can come. Uh, oh, and be sure to bring Mrs. Ransom. I think she's so sweet. I told her you'd call for but, her. But, but... I'm so glad I ran into you. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad nights. <laughs> moment now, Mr. Gildersleeve will be arriving. We are very happy to have him back with us, and let's show him we are, shall we? Well, I don't know why not. Uh, how shall we do that, Mrs. Pettibone? Well, that's a very good question, Mr. Peavy. Well, in the first place, none of us think Mr. Gildersleeve is fat anymore, do we? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, don't be so literal, Peavy. She means nobody should make any remarks about his figure. And one more thing. Remember that Mr. Gildersleeve is not completely won over yet. The question of the play remains a delicate point, and I suggest you let me handle that. Shall I go, love? Will you, love? Yes, love. <laughs> now, uh, we're all clear on everything? Mm, oh, yes. So. Yeah. Well, of all people, Gildersleeve and Mrs. Ransom. Gildersleeve, I never saw you looking better. Mrs. Ransom, you look like a million dollars. Oh, now, don't. Oh, I should have gone myself. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm so glad to see you. And Mrs. Ransom. Good evening, Mrs. Pettibone. Mrs. Pettibone, I want to make one thing clear to your committee. I'm only here because I believe in fire engines. Oh, so public-spirited. I quite understand, Mr. Gildersleeve, and believe me, all of us appreciate your generosity. Good evening, Throckmorton. Leela, glad to see you. Good evening, Judge. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. You've lost a little flesh, haven't you? <laughs> I don't really know, PB. I fluctuate, of course. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, uh, Mrs. Ransom, won't you sit down, please? Uh, thank, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now, as you all know, we've made quite a little progress in planning our entertainment. And I would like to call on the chairman of the different committees to make their reports. Let me see now, Judge Hooker. I believe you were the auditorium committee. Yes, ma'am. I'm very happy to report that we've been offered the Elks Hall for the night of the show. Will it cost us anything? No, but we'll have to let the Elks in at half price. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you, Judge. Isn't that splendid, Mr. Gildersleeve? You're just fine, Mrs. Pettibone. Congratulations, Judge. Uh, Mrs. Pettibone, can uh, I make my report now? Mr. Peavy, if you don't mind, I'll call on my husband first. I know he has some very good news for us on the ticket situation. Speak up, love. Well, Fred Rosenoff is going to print the tickets for us. And if they're all sold, that'll bring in almost $1,500. Oh, I think that's marvelous, Dr. Pettibone. That's an awful lot of money. Well, of course, so far we haven't sold any. It, oh. Is Rosenoff charging us to print the tickets? Oh, no. He has a bad gallbladder I'm looking at. Yeah. <laughs> Could I make my report now, please? Just a minute, Peavy. Uh, Mrs. Pettibone, I'd like to say a few words. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve will be so pleased, won't we? Of course, oh, Gildersleeve. Right. Right. Uh, thank you, thank you. We'd just like to say that I think the committee has done a wonderful job, and I'm proud to be associated with the committee. Uh, that's all. Oh, uh, Mrs. Pettibone, I'd like to have some idea about the show. Oh, of course, my dear. One thing I meant to tell you, we have a wonderful part for you in which you simply must wear that lovely dress you were telling me about. Oh, now, isn't that thrilling, Throckmorton, you hear? That's fine, Oh, Lilla. may I say at this time how pleased I am that we've all forgotten our little differences. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure we're all going to put our shoulders to the wheel and all pull together. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, there's just one thing now that would make the evening perfect. Uh, what's that, Mr. Pettibone? Uh, I've never heard you sing. Uh, won't you favor us with a selection? My gala, she stops at nothing. Uh, now, Mrs. Pettibone, I told you I'm much too busy to take part in oh, the entertainment. But just for our pleasure this evening, Mr. Gildersleeve, uh, please, I'm told you really have a golden voice. Well, I used to do quite a bit of singing in my younger days. Oh, he sings beautifully. Do sing, Throckmorton. Will you play for me, Leela? I'd love to. Well, what shall it be? Something short? Uh, how about drink to me only with thine eyes? Uh, nothing for me, thank you. Why, <laughs> Lee? <laughs> Why, Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. Oh. 
within the cup and I'll not ask for wine the thirst that from the soul doth rise doth ask a drink divine You think so? Oh, simply thrilling, and it's given me a perfectly marvelous idea for my play. Oh, it has? Yes, a twist to the story, where a famous opera star comes to this little town where the heroine lives, that's Mrs. Branson, uh -oh. and of course when she hears him sing, she falls head over heels in love with him. Naturally. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, you've got to play the part. Oh, no. Now, please, please, remember our cause, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, for the sake of the fire engine, all right. Oh, splendid. That's fine. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so happy I just know the play is going to be a tremendous success. Yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll take in enough money to buy two fire engines. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Pettibone, could I make my committee report now, please? Oh, of course, Mr. Peavy, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, just what was your committee? The fire engine committee. Oh, yes. And the report? There won't be any fire engines for sale until after the war. Oh! <laughs> been a lot of kidding around here about Gildersleeve's stomach, but I guess we're all a little concerned about our stomachs these days and what we're going to put in them. They tell me the Army's going to need half of our processed foods this year, which leaves just half as much for you and me as we've been accustomed to. That's why they're going to put in this point rationing system. There'll be a lot of jokes about rationing. I hope I get my share of them. But when you come right down to it, rationing is the only fair way of distributing the food that's available. It gives women with war jobs the same chance as those who can spend the whole day shopping around from market to market. And the poor man will get just as much as the rich man. It's the only fair and democratic way of handling it. Another thing. You hear a lot of vague talk about how much of our food has been going to our allies on Lend-Lease. We looked into that. And do you know how much of our food all our allies got last year? Only 7.5%. And if that contributed even a little... To what the Russians are doing to the Nazis right now, brother, it was cheap. Good night, everybody. speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Have you discovered the speedy way to make swell macaroni and cheese? These days, clever women prepare that favorite main dish without any fuss of making a cheese sauce, without any bother with blanching and baking the macaroni. They simply open up a package of the product called Kraft Dinner. They cook the special Kraft Dinner macaroni quickly in boiling water. And with the Kraft grated, which also comes in each Kraft Dinner package, they sprinkle the cheese flavor through and through. Presto, the dinner main dish is ready in only seven minutes cooking time. And the cost is only a very few cents a serving. But the best part of it is, Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese is extra special good. Fluffy, light, and drenched in cheese flavor. When good cooks discover the seven-minute way of making macaroni and cheese, they say never again to the old-fashioned slow method. Of course, Kraft Dinner is extra popular these days. You can help your dealer with his problem of keeping stocked by ordering your Kraft Dinner early in the week. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcast.